Hey everyone, thanks so much for checking out this content on the Hillview YouTube channel. My name's Martin. Uh, my name is Scott. Uh, we're two of the pastors at the church and it's our joy to welcome you to this time. We would love it if you were able to come and join us in person. If you'd like to do that, there's some contact details at the end of the video for how you can get in touch and we'd love to connect you up in that way. Uh, but we also understand that maybe you don't feel that you're able to join us in person yet. And so we do hope that this video is a blessing to you, that you find out a bit of what's happening in the church and you're able to study God's word with us. Um, we also understand that some people have been joining us from further afield. And we would love it if you could be part of a local uh, fellowship, a local church. And, and we would love to help you with that as well. And so if we can, please get in touch with us. But it's great to have you here with us. Yeah, so we're just praying that you will be blessed and helped by this content and that Jesus will be glorified through this video. So take care. God bless. The Lord has risen. He, he has, has risen, risen indeed. indeed. The Lord is risen. He, he is, is risen, risen indeed. indeed. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? Death has been swallowed up in victory. Christ has risen indeed. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live, even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord has risen. He has risen indeed. Alleluia. Awesome. Praise God. Please have a seat just now. And we're going to continue in prayer this morning. Father in heaven, we come to you this morning with hearts of joy, hearts of thanksgiving, hearts of celebration, for you are the victorious king of all the earth. Lord, we thank you for this moment when we can look back to that day in history when you rose victorious, beating the power of death, breaking free from that grave that could not hold you, from that slumber that could not keep you down. We praise you this morning, God. We give glory to your name. We marvel at your power. We wonder at your victory. No other human being could or has or could beat the power of death. Only you, Lord Jesus, because of your sinless life, only you sapped death of its power. And we bless you and we worship you this morning. Lord, as the woman did that first Easter morning, we want to come and fall at your feet in worship. We exalt you as the glorious, triumphant Savior of the world. And Father, we thank you that because of your resurrection, our faith is not in vain. We are not mumbling some empty words to a forgotten hero, but instead we believe that you are still alive and reigning still, seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven. And Lord, we just come this morning so thankful that it is your desire, your invitation, that we can share in that victory that you have won over death. So Lord, I pray that we would know that reality. Life in Christ today, this morning. We just welcome you to this place. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Good morning and happy Easter. Happy Easter. Uh, I've got a couple of helpers who are going to hand out uh, some sheets and some pens and paper to all of the children. Uh, and so this uh, talk is going to be split into two parts. And so the first part is on the first half side of the sheet. And you can fill in some answers. Don't worry, the, the, they'll come up on the screen to help you out. And then we'll have a break. And I think we're going to uh, worship some more. And the band will come up and lead us in some worship. And then I'll come back up and I'll share on the second part. Uh, but Jacob, if you're okay to put the first lot of slides up on the screen, that would be great. Thank you. Uh, so today, we are going to be looking at some evidence. So to start with, I'm going to give you some clues about someone in the church. This is going to describe someone in the church. And boys and girls, I need you to guess who this might be. So Jacob, let's put the clues on the screen. So the first clue is this person is a great dancer. Now, you've all just seen each other dance, and I know what you're all thinking. It must be Nigel. It must be, <laughs> must be Nigel. <laughs> Sorry, Nigel. <laughs> I didn't see her dancing. It might have been amazing. 
The next one, this person likes to do some knitting. I wonder who that could be as well. It rules me out. I think it probably rules like Martin, unless he's got some hidden gifts that I'm unaware of at the moment. The third one, this person, uh, I, can't, I can't read that screen here. Man, I need my eyes test. Lived in Nepal for six months. The fourth clue, this person is studying to become an occupational therapist, which is very useful considering the dancing that I did and how I struggled with it. I might need this person to come to my home. And the fifth one, this person is a children's church leader. Now, boys and girls, who do you think that describes? Isla, who do you think? Hannah is Hannah White. It is, it is Hannah. And thank you so much to Hannah and Emily for completely and utterly exhausting us. So but thank you so much for leading us in that dancing. It was great fun. Uh, so today we are going to be looking at an evidence of a different kind. We are going to be looking at evidence of the resurrection of Jesus. It's what we and Christians all over the world are celebrating today. And the question of, do you believe that Jesus rose from the grave, is one that we all need to answer. No matter who you are, no matter what you believe, we all believe in a miracle of some sort. Do you believe in this miracle? Maybe you believe that the world just started without intelligent design, or maybe you believe that God spoke the world into being. The question of the resurrection dramatically impacts our life like no other does. How you answer this question, it informs our choices, it informs our beliefs, our actions, and it informs how we deal with other big questions that we face. So boys and girls, and adults, of course, this morning, we're going to be looking at that evidence. And then, what does that evidence mean for us? So as I gave you evidence or clues to who Hannah is, we have some clear evidence of the resurrection of Jesus. This is not something that we just believe in blindly, but there is substantial evidence. And so boys and girls, you should have your worksheet now. Can you show me your worksheet? Give a little wave in the air, a little wave in the air. And so we'll say, adults, if you're wanting one as well, please let Matthew or Bethany know it and they can give you one and you can fill it out. You can take it home and put it on your fridge as well. There are six pieces of evidence that we are going to look at. And so, Jacob, can you put the first one on the screen? And so, on your your sheet there, boys and girls, you've got a little bit where you can fill in the answer. And the answer is the underlined bit. I've tried to make this as obvious as possible, what you're meant to write in the sheet, so that there's, there's no ambiguity in this at all. So the first piece of evidence that we have is that Jesus said it would happen. So in John chapter 2, so we're going through the gospel of John together. So back in chapter 2, when were we in in chapter 2? A long time ago. Anyways, in chapter 2, verse 19, Jesus says, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And he's speaking of himself. In Matthew chapter 12, he said, No sign will be given this generation except the sign of Jonah. And we all know what happened with Jonah, that he was in the belly of the whale for three days. And then after three days, the whale spat him out onto dry land. But Jesus is speaking of himself. We remember all of the miracles that Jesus did, including raising Lazarus from the dead and all that he taught. If Jesus hadn't said that it would happen, we'd at least be surprised But he did speak of it. We also see other things that Jesus spoke of and how they came to pass as well. So Jesus, the Son of God, said that he would rise and we take those words seriously. So Jesus said it would happen. Number two, Jacob, if you can put it on the screen. We see how the Pharisees reacted. And you can read of this in Matthew chapter 27 and in 28. But we see the Pharisees, they did three things. And all of them actually point towards the resurrection. So the first thing that they did is that they asked for the Romans to seal the tomb. So this meant that an official seal was put on the tomb. Now, boys and girls, I wonder if you were like me when I was your age. And when they said that they sealed the tomb, I had this picture of someone going around with kitchen or bathroom sealant around the stone. And I don't know if they used the white stuff or the clear stuff, but I had this picture that they would go around the tomb to seal it. Now, that's not exactly what it is. This is an official seal, a Roman seal, and this seal proved that he was dead. Now, the Romans were good at a 
lot of things, but one of the things that they were actually very good at, and it's quite sad, but they were very good at killing people. And so when the Romans said that someone was dead and verified it, this person was definitely dead. So what this seal has done is just um, ensured that no one in the world can say, ah, Jesus probably wasn't dead then. So that's the first thing that the Pharisees did. They then asked for a Roman guard at the tomb, and this means that no one can accuse the disciples of stealing the body. So we read of that in Matthew 27, verses 62 to 66. So when it says a Roman guard, it probably would have been about four guards uh, on like a three-hour shift on rotations. So these are Roman soldiers. They're well-trained. They're fresh and alert. And so I don't think that a group of fishermen and tax collectors could take on these Roman soldiers who were good at what they did. So this just proves that the disciples couldn't come and steal the body. And the last thing that the Pharisees did is that they had to start bribing people. And so you can read about that in Matthew 28. And so they had to start paying off the Roman soldiers to stop them from saying what had actually happened. So all their actions, all the actions of the Pharisees, all that they've done is actually go on to prove the resurrection of Jesus. Jacob, you can go for the third one. And that is the tomb was empty. So if none of this was true, if Jesus hadn't risen from the grave, the simplest way to put a stop to all of this is for the Pharisees to simply show the body of Jesus. If they do that, then all of this stops. All of this goes away. They don't need to think about this at all. They can move on. But they couldn't. The tomb was empty. Number four, Jacob, please. We see the change in the disciples. So after the death of Jesus... This is how we see the disciples. This is the way they're described. This is how we see them. We see them fearful. We see them hiding. We see them doubting. We see insecurity. And we see them full of shame. But after seeing Jesus, then being filled with the Holy Spirit, they were new people. And so the way that we saw them described, they are now completely different. And this is how we see them. We see them being bold. We see them being passionate, fearless, single-minded, and devoted. And then the star of Acts, the book of Acts, we see Peter. He gives his first recorded sermon, and he's quoting from lots of different parts of Scripture. He's this incredible grasp of, of Scripture, and he leads 3,000 people to come and follow Jesus that day. We saw the change in disciples from fearful to boldness, and we see the power of Jesus go out. And actually, in all the disciples, we see them eventually give their lives for Jesus. You don't do that unless you've had some incredible change, unless you have met the risen Savior, Jesus. Number five, please, Jacob. Hope, boys and girls, you're managing to keep up. So there were over 500 eyewitnesses to Jesus. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 4 through 6, it says this. Christ was raised on the third day. He appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. So the apostle Paul is writing this to the church in Corinth. And he's saying, don't just take my word for it. He's saying, go and speak to these other people, most of whom are still alive. And they saw Jesus as well. Take their word for it too. Now, boys and girls, I wonder, I'm going to see how many of you know a bit about law. Maybe not too many, so we might need, I hear we've got someone straight up, yes. If you want to prove something in a court, how many witnesses do you need? Yeah, and so, so there's different people in a courtroom, but if you want to prove something, I'm going to go to my wife who studied law in this. Uh, Rachel, how many witnesses do you need? Two. It is two. You need two witnesses in a court if you were to prove something to be factual here. So it's not just two witnesses that we had that Jesus rose from the grave. We had 500. Now, I like a stat, but even I can't figure out what the percentage increase in two to 500 is. But it's a lot, people. It is a lot. So there were over 500 eyewitnesses. What's the last one, please, Jacob, if you can go to that? Yeah. So we see the power of Jesus today. Since the resurrection of Jesus and the coming of the Holy Spirit, we've seen his power to change. 
And so we continue to see that through the Bible and through the scriptures. We see the Apostle Paul, someone who was a Christian murderer, to someone who became a Christian, to someone who planted churches all across the Mediterranean. And we continue to see in the book of Acts the power of Jesus, the power of the Holy Spirit. And today we continue to see his power at work. We see his healing. We see people coming to know him. We see our experiences of God's love, how we see him at work in us today, comforting, guiding, convicting, transforming lives. We see people freed from addictions, courageous decisions made, the incredible impact the church has made on societies around the world. We see the impact in our own lives and how Jesus has saved each and every single one of us who trust in him. So for all of us sitting here today as well, we are proof of the resurrection. So boys and girls, you will face many big questions in life. Some of you at some point are gonna have to choose what you are going to study in school. Some of you at some point are gonna choose what kind of career that you might have. Will you go to university? What kind of job will you have? What kind of college you might go to? Will you take an apprenticeship? These are all big questions. But none of these questions are as big as the question of, do you believe that Jesus rose from the grave? What do you think? Girls, you need your worksheet back again, and you're going to need the other side of that worksheet, and hopefully you can continue to fill it in. So we've looked at the evidence, and now I want to look at what does that mean for us if we believe that Jesus rose from the grave. And so to do this, I want to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So if you want to turn there in your Bibles, if you need a Bible, there is plenty in the back there in the shelves. If you don't have a Bible at home, please just take it. And we would love for you to have that as a gift from us. So 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 14 through 20. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. It feels quite complicated, this. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Those are some really powerful words and some pretty blunt ones too. And they are supposed to be useless, lying, guilty, lost, pitied. But if you, like me, believe that Jesus rose from the grave, then we can flip that message around. And so, Jacob, if you can put the, the second PowerPoint on. There we go. So there's your answer to the first question, boys, boys. We can be confident in our faith. Verse 14 says that our faith, our belief and trust in Jesus is useless, or other translations say in vain, if he didn't rise. But since Jesus rose, that means that our faith is not in vain. And we can have rock-solid certainty in what we believe. It means that we can trust in Jesus in all circumstances. It means that we can trust in his teaching. We can count on his unending love and care for us. It means we can trust in him to do what he has said that he will do. It means that prayer is not useless. It means that reading the Bible is not useless. It means that, thankfully, preaching is not useless. <laughs> it means singing, gathering as this church. All we do to display God's love is not in vain, but we can have confidence in our faith that these are the best things that we can do. So number one, we can be confident in our belief. Number two, Jacob, we can be confident in God's word. The apostles' teaching is true. Verse 15 says that if Jesus had not risen from the grave, that the apostles would be lying. Now those are some strong words to accuse someone of, but that's not the case. 
Therefore, everything we have recorded in the Bible, a book that all points to Jesus, is completely true. The Bible is therefore the truth, the absolute truth, not to be argued with. It is the very words of God. Now, young people, you're often going to hear in society people say, this is my truth, that is your truth. Now, it can feel like a catchy and cool thing to say, but it's a false statement. Truth is found in Jesus. Truth is found in his word, and we can trust in Jesus. God's word is Bibles that we have, filled with the word of God, is authoritative. It means that whenever someone asks us why we are doing something or why you believe something, you can point to the word of God because it is truth. We can be confident in God's word. Number three, please, Jacob. Here you go, boys and girls. We can be confident that we are forgiven. So verse 17 says, If Jesus had not been raised, then we are still guilty of our sins. If Jesus had not risen, how would we know if his sacrifice was powerful enough to deal with our sin? Sin is something that separates us from God. Sin is a problem that we ourselves cannot defeat. We are not powerful enough to do that. That is why Jesus came, to reconcile us to God by taking the punishment that our sins deserve. If Jesus had not risen, how would we know that Jesus had defeated sin? How would we know that we could be forgiven? But we know that he did rise from the grave. We know his sacrifice on the cross was enough. We know that he did defeat sin and death. Therefore, we know that our sins are forgiven. In Psalm chapter 103, verse 12, it says, As far as the east is from the west, I have no idea if that is east or west. I'm assuming it's probably that way. As far as the east is from the west, he has removed our transgressions from us. Now, can you imagine how Peter, the apostle Peter, would have lived after he had denied Jesus three times as Jesus was tried? Jesus, in the midst of a sham trial, and Peter denies that he knows Jesus, let alone as a follower of him. How would he have lived if Jesus hadn't come back? And you can read about that at the end of John. Uh, end of John and says, feed my sheep. He had this conversation where he says, feed my sheep, feed my sheep, feed my sheep. And Peter says, I love you, I love you, I love you. Where Peter was able to express his love. I think if that hadn't happened, Peter would have lived with regret and shame. But as we saw earlier, that is not the Peter that we saw living. We saw a Peter living full of joy, full of passion, he was bold, full of faith, and we saw that incredible message that he preached. Peter was a man that knew of Jesus' forgiveness. Peter was a man that knew what new life in Jesus was. And just as Peter experienced that forgiveness, we can all experience that forgiveness too. Don't live in guilt or shame. Live as a forgiven child of God. And we can do that because we know we believe in the risen Savior, Jesus. Number four, we can be confident in our future with Jesus. Verse 18 says, if Jesus had not risen, in that case, all who have died believing in Christ are lost. Or other translations say perished. But we are not lost. In fact, we can rely on what Jesus says in John 3, 16, that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but will have eternal life. In Philippians 1, we read these words from the Apostle Paul. He says, for to me, living means living for Christ, and dying is even better. But if I live, I can do more fruitful work for Christ. So I really don't know which is better, I'm torn between two desires. I long to go and be with Christ, which would be far better for me. Paul knew no matter what, and he faced a lot of very dangerous situations, that his eternity was secured with Jesus. And we can all know of that as well. Jesus has said that he is going to prepare a place for us. 
If you believe in him, if you trust in Jesus, then your future is secure. And one day you will be with him in his perfect presence, lifting up his name, singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty with the multitudes praising him forevermore. We can be confident in our future with Jesus and our future is something that we should be so excited about. And the last one for your worksheet there. Go for it, Jacob, in the last one. We can be confident as others may pity. Verse 19 says, And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone in this world. If Jesus hadn't risen from the grave, we would be pitied and the world would feel sorry for us. We would be pitied for the way that we choose to spend our money, for how we choose to use our time, for why we sing songs together, why we pray, why we make some hard choices to worship someone that we believe is so much greater than us. If Jesus didn't rise, we should be pitied for those choices. But that's not the case. A number of years back, I was down in St. Andrews. Myself and Martin go down there in June for the Scottish Baptist Ministers Fellowship. And there's about 100 of us who join together from like a Tuesday to like a Thursday morning. But what you normally find is on the Wednesday afternoon, all of us go and find a coffee shop because we all have a bit of prep to do for that weekend. Uh, And so there was a number of us sitting in Acosta. uh, And I remember I was sitting there and I was reading through a commentary in the Book of Romans because uh, the young adults, we were going through the Book of Romans at the time. And so sorry, right, I'll read a bit of a, a commentary. So I was doing that, I had my Bible open, I was reading my commentary and I was writing a few notes. And I could see there was a few other pastors around me. Uh, and so one just not far was Andy Hayes, who used to be the pastor here. He's now the pastor at Bridges Dawn uh, Baptist Church. Uh, and so anyways, I did my work. And then I was like, I'm going for a walk. It's a nice day. So I went for a walk. Uh, now, later on that day, uh, Andy came up to me. And uh, he was kind of giggling a little bit. He was just like, Scott, I wish you could have heard some of the conversation that happened with two ladies that were on the table next to you when you left. And he overheard it. And they were just saying, oh, what a poor man that he would be reading those things and that he would be trusting in those things, how he is wasting his life. We are often pitied, aren't we? But we should not be. We can be confident because Christ is risen from the grave. And not to be pitied, what I was doing in that coffee shop I think was probably one of the best things I could be doing with any of my time at any point of day any point in the week, any point in the month. Jesus rose from the grave. Instead of being pitied by this world, we believe that it is our honor to believe in God. That it is a privilege to be a part of God's family. It is a privilege to be called his adopted sons and daughters. We are wanted by the living God. We are valued and we are loved by the God of all creation the one who is so much more powerful, so much more majestic, so much more splendid than we could ever consider or imagine. We are to be a light in this world that pities us. We are to be a light to display how awesome he is, how loving he is, the life that we have in Jesus, this resurrection life that we have. We are meant to live out boldly amongst those who may pity us so that one day, one day, They may say, yes, I also believe in the resurrection. One day, they may join us in this space here, lifting up the name of Jesus, spending time in prayer, spending time in his words, singing to his glorious name. So the question I asked at the start is, do you believe in the resurrection? Do you believe? Peter said to them, uh, this is in Acts 2, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. This morning, I don't know where you are all at, but my prayer is, is that for all of us, that we would believe in this risen Savior. Would you come and know of his love? Would you come and receive of his forgiveness? Would you live for him with everything that you have? 
And boys and girls, thank you for listening so well there. And so and at the bottom of the, that second side of the sheet, there's a little crossword, and all the answers should fit in nicely to that. So see if you can complete that. Uh, but before uh, the band come up, or if the band come up, I'll, I'll pray. Father, we thank you so much that today that we celebrate our risen Savior. What a glorious day this is. And just as we celebrate you today, Lord, we can celebrate you like this in every single day. Because the truth that you have risen from the grave is true forevermore. And Lord, would we live out of that truth? Would we live with that boldness? Live with that passion? Would we display your love to this world? Would we not hide it? But would we live in confidence of the resurrected Christ? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.